Hello, Internet. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is uh, Jos Graham. I'm a developer advocate at Launch Darkly, and welcome to Test in Production. Today is June the 18th, 2020. Our guest today is Ben Wilson, Engineering Manager at Envision, who uh, is joining us today from Bro Brooklyn. Uh, Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello, thank you for joining us. Ah, thank um, you for having me. And you're going to be talking to us about um, virtual squads, using virtual squads to accelerate um, projects in large organizations. Such yes, as indeed. Vision. Yeah. Cool. Uh, topic very near and dear to my heart. <laughs> As an engineering manager, we're always looking for ways to, uh, you know, just improve upon our speed and velocity and, uh, you know, get meaningful impact to customers quickly. Cool. But that's always going to be useful, um, especially in large <laughs> organizations that have terrible trouble with this sort of thing. Um, and before we get started, I know you've been keeping busy during quarantine with some arts and crafts. Oh, yeah. Um, I've got my embroidery machine behind me there. Uh, we have a cricket maker in the other room. Uh, I'm a big fan of, of using the plotter to cut things. I sort of make my own uh, bootleg stickers for Envision, for instance, and mm -hmm. uh, send them out to, to new team members. Um, I also like working with paper crafts, so just recently uh, made this box here. Uh, oh, that's fabulous. Yeah. So, uh, see that? Cool. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to hear. Well, we will go into that more late, uh, um, <laughs> later in the session, I think, because having only just learned about cricket makers, I'm incredibly interested. They're um, the best. <laughs> so you're going to uh, talk for 15 minutes or so on virtual squads. We will be taking questions um, and answering questions. Uh, if you are watching, please post your questions in the Twitch chat stream. Um, and we will be going until shortly before, uh, for the next almost an hour or so, until 11 a.m. Pacific, um, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern, which is where you are. And um, I think we may even have some viewers in Britain at the moment. Excellent. Um, so take it away, Ben. Okay, well, great. Uh, yeah, so for anyone just joining, um, I'll just reintroduce myself real quick. I'm Benjamin Wilson, Engineering Manager at Envision, and my talk today is going to focus on startup speed in the enterprise. We're going to cover uh, the need for speed, so timely projects with clear business cases uh, that align with your high-level company goals. We're going to talk about virtual squads as a possible tactic to accelerate your delivery, and then we're going to dive into a recent example I had assembling and running such a team. Uh, so you might have had this experience, you're at a large company and you lament that you're moving so slow. When you're building enterprise grade software with best practices and compliance top of mind, your org will tend to grow quite big, requiring more layers of coordination and process along the way. And that's going to make you move at a slower pace, right? So, uh, which isn't even a bad thing, right? Uh, generally, that means that you're hardening your product, that you're going to make it available in new markets uh, or new languages, and that you're going to scale to millions of users. But occasionally an opportunity presents itself and you need to act now and move fast in order to capitalize on it. So let's say when those instances occur that you don't have a team that can really accomplish the goal with the way you're currently structured uh, and you need to move quick, maybe create your own lane to uh, cut through some red tape and seize on the opportunity. The method that we use at Envision is called virtual squads. Uh, but before I get into the virtual squads, uh, I think it's maybe worth uh, touching on a few other cross-squad collaboration methods. So oftentimes, you know, all you really need to do is open a pull request against another team's repo, uh, do the work for them, have them uh, review it and deploy it on your behalf, and that's, you're done. That's your cross-team collaboration. Um, but there are those occasions where you need to work with uh, two or more teams, and as long as there isn't a ton of overlap in the work, you might be best served by having shared OKRs that you agree to. Uh, it's only really when you have this like weird jigsaw uh, that cuts through multiple teams, or you're doing something like you know net new that you'd reach for the virtual squad option. And just to explain a little better what I mean by virtual squad, I'm talking about a temporary cross-team squad exempt from organizational constructs to deliver it against a specific outcome. And to break that down, uh, why temporary? Well, you're borrowing folks from other teams and parts of the business and both they and their managers would like to know when they're going to be coming back. Also, by making it temporary, it's easier to get buy-in from leadership. You know, this is finite. 
and we're going to have an exit strategy. Exempt from organizational constructs. So you need the right people to achieve your outcome. And uh, this is an area where you really don't want to compromise. So pushing here leads to the further discussion and weighing this opportunity against other bets the business is making. That's a good thing. Also, try not to box yourself in uh, you know, with titles or organizational boundaries. Really just get the right people. Uh, and then finally, your goal or specific outcome is your rallying cry. It's the, it's the, it's the thing that's going to bring your team together and the business around it. And it also reinforces the temporary nature of the squad. So we can get into a few examples of when you might want to use a virtual squad. Uh, when you're building something zero to one, or when you're re-architecting shared infrastructure, or as an accelerator for important initiatives across the business. Um, so moving from the abstract to something a little more concrete, I'm going to talk about uh, a case study that we had for specs. Um, you know, as, as we survey our customers and we engage them, we discovered this year a key area of focus was improving designer to developer handoff. And in those instances, what we're really looking at is developers wanting to know what prototypes are ready to develop, where they can go and envision to find what's ready to implement, having like their own space within the platform, and designers wanting to see progress from the developer within the Envision platform. So our proposed solution to this was a new document type called Specs. It allows designers to break down large prototypes and designs into the subset of screens you need to build. Uh, this way, the designer can document requirements for the developer, complete with artwork, UX maps, annotations, and specific guidance. For developers, they need to be able to click into those artboards and you know, get at the measurements, fonts, colors, and assets they need to do their work. And I think the best part of this is that it seamlessly integrates with Jira, so you can easily connect an Envision spec with a Jira ticket or Epic, enabling the developer to quickly and easily get at the design requirements and stay up to date with any changes that happen on the spec. And then conversely, the designer can follow along on the spec to see where the ticket is in progress. So we have this idea. It's a potentially big opportunity. What's the next step? Well, we need to break down the problem. Uh, this project is going to be complex. It had a, 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 <laughs> it had a diverse set of needs. Uh, this is going to be a zero to one product. So it needed a new domain service. It needed a new spa. So we needed a good mix of front end and back end folks. This product was also going to be built by uh, essentially taking other products and, and pieces of the business. So we needed domain experts on the pieces that we would be leveraging. Uh, this product was also going to be built on some legacy systems. So picking someone who was a bit of a historian helped us you know, kind of navigate the winding road of why we built this thing in this way in the past. Um, and then the project was going to need approval from various guilds and architecture teams. So it was important to pick folks that had you know, influence and, uh, and would want to champion the architectural design with those, uh, with those other stakeholders. So then it came time to assemble the team and begin working. Um, above all, what counts here is people. You need people with that X factor, people that are excited and passionate about the project and the vision that you have, people that are senior enough to take ownership without needing excessive requirements or a well-groomed backlog, uh, people that you know can maintain a good attitude and be positive even under pressure, and people that you can instill a lot of trust in. And once you have those people, you need to make sure that they're all in. If you have people there 50-50 or 80-20, they're going to get distracted by the other work streams they have going, and things can fall apart. In terms of squads, uh, rituals, and comms, you're going to run this like any other regular Agile team. Two-week sprints, retros, stand-ups, all the usual stuff there. A couple of notes here, though, is um, if you can, favor explorations like spikes and proof of concepts over technical documentation. I tend to find you get a stronger signal path by starting to walk down it than you know, remaining in the abstract. And then if you've committed to an aggressive deadline, try to uh, cut scope over cutting quality. And where you do cut quality or cut corners, make sure that you over communicate that and have a plan in place to address it once you get something into customers' hands. Speaking of getting things into customers' hands, you need a good release strategy. For us, this is where Launch Darkly is amazing. Uh, we're big fans of it. So in this instance, we had one feature flag across four teams that allowed us to onboard new users across you know, native apps, uh, within space and home, and on our new document type. We're able to target internal teams sooner, 
And then we essentially used rules to create new sets of cohorts. Because we hadn't done a lot of performance testing against this, it allowed us to like quickly roll back if, if we brought on too many users at once. And we're still using it uh, at this point to de-risk new features. So as we add new text and drawing tools uh, to specs, uh, all of those are behind feature flags. And then like the, uh, the yin to yang of this is that you need a good way to collect feedback. Uh, we want to do that in a highly collaborative way. So we created a new workspace in Slack, brought our customers into it, brought our engineers into it. And uh, on the first day of the beta, we actually had a user notice a bug with how their artboards were being displayed. They called it out in Slack, and one of our engineers was able to respond to them directly and actually help them uh, identify the bug and then ship a resolution within like an hour or two. Um, you know, the other great thing about having a Slack workspace is that your customers uh, can also engage each other and share what their experience is, uh, which kind of creates a nice flywheel for communication overall. So with all that in mind, um, we were able to reduce our time to market with this approach, leveraging existing technology, dogfooding things internally, and we were able to go from idea to team formation to beta in just under three months. And on the first day of the beta, we were able to respond to users' feedback in real time and improve the experience for them. So um, for us, this was hitting bigger deadlines in record time and uh, getting to learning sooner. So I'm looking forward to uh, any questions you have or the uh, community out there on Twitch. And uh, thanks for listening. Thank you very much. It's great. Um, and uh, yes, um, as Ben said, uh, we are eager to take your questions today. So um, on the Twitch chat, please give us anything you'd like to address. I mean, I have a bunch of questions um, about this approach because I can imagine that uh, it's the kind of thing that, I mean, you've presented a lot of the upsides here and some of the things to be aware of, um, but there's got to be some trade-offs, right? If you're taking an existing organization structure and dynamically suddenly changing it, I can imagine that causes a bunch of problems. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have to, for every person that you're going to take from a different team, and I think we ended up taking folks from four, four or five different teams, they had to you know, measure the impact to their own roadmaps to help us uh, create this new experience. And we had to weigh all of those decisions. Um, and and you know, as, um, as we went along to like, I think we discovered like some other pain points about not having everybody be all in. Um, so that's actually why we've added that slide to this deck. We had some people who were partially committed and that created challenges around scheduling certain meetings we needed to or understanding like, you know, what of their time was going to be available to us. So I think that was a big learning. Uh, yeah, it's um, I, uh, how do you deal with that? I mean, it's kind of uh, if you is this only possible, presumably when you have um, uh, a situation where, where the the teams so. Well, actually, let me start, step back a bit. How do you pick who's going to be in this virtual squad? Is it based more on like who the ideal people are and then you try and persuade their existing team leads and um, project managers? Or is it more about which teams currently have capacity, which, which long-term squads or long-term teams currently have capacity to lend some of their key people? Yeah, I mean, it can be a mix of those approaches. I, I try to be as idealist as possible and figure out who is going to best accelerate this project or look for gaps. And as you're assembling the team, you're going to discover where you have gaps or you need coverage and you want to find those folks um, that, that you can bring in as well, you know? Um, and, and one thing to actually watch out for with a virtual squad is like, you don't want to uh, stack the deck with too much talent um, because having brilliant people being idle means that you might over optimize or over-engineer your solution. And really what you want to do is get signal from users because if this doesn't work at all, you know, copy pasting something is fine because now you're just throwing that away and <laughs> you can try the next thing. So uh, it's, it's honestly better to, to try to run this, the, the squad as light as you can and, and you know, not, not overextend anyone, but, but make sure that they're all kind of like you know, stretching to uh, create the coverage you need. Right. So, um, well, a question we have from Mustak 
in the chat saying, can you prepare for the case where you need more time than expected? Does every affected team need to commit to potentially giving up their folks for longer? Yeah, that that absolutely uh, that ab absolutely did happen in this case. We were uh, hoping to have somebody roll off the squad earlier, and um, due to other changes, we needed them there longer. And so you have to essentially have the same conversation you had when you brought them in, and and say like, hey, is placing the bet on this new thing uh, more important than what they could be doing back on their other squad? Um, but you can also swap other folks in too. Like if you, the picture I have of this virtual squad in the all in section, um, I think 50% of that remains on the virtual squad for this next leg. Um, right. So there's some fluidity there, you know, like sometimes you really do need to get those people back to the, uh, the good work they were doing elsewhere. So that kind of, to me, the, the, the first, you know, question that raises as a, as a software engineer is Brooks law. Right. In that if you try and swap people in and out dynamically in the middle of a project, doesn't that cause massive slowness in itself? Um, sorry, I should quote for those those who aren't sure the reference. Uh, Fred Brooks, writer of the of the Mythical Man Month, which is possibly the longest lived and best known software engineering text in existence. Um, uh, the law is adding more people to a software to a late project makes it later because um, of especially the cost of getting them up to speed is is primarily the issue here. Yeah, uh, you do incur those costs. Um, so you, you kind of have to bake that in. Um, but what, what's ideal is as you're transitioning somebody out, if you can get like a week or two of overlap with who is going to be uh, coming in and have them shadow the person who's leaving, uh, you know, pairing is is a great way to uh, reduce ramp up time, and, and just having them, you know, kind of move in lockstep. So I, I found that that's a good way to like uh, not get such a drag on velocity as you're rotating people. That's a good point. I mean, it sounds to me fairly challenging from a project manager point of view. It's there's a lot of planning, a lot of you know, independent. Uh, <laughs> Not just agility, but improvisation needed. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, early early in the project, uh, you would come to stand up and find that, uh, you know, a developer had been working on another ticket um, much of the day. And as long as you're instilling that trust in them uh, and they're making the right calls, you can actually move faster by by having less overhead and, and sort of like less structure around it up front. If everyone understands what the outcome is and feels like they're they're able to like unblock themselves and to move with some autonomy uh, that can be a good strategy to mitigate that and of course that can go wildly wrong but that's again where like you know trust and building relationships with folks will really uh, you know ease that um, concern so we, we actually brought a TPM into the project a little bit later um, like much closer to when we were going to launch the private beta to just look at what we had at that point. Um, and it just felt like the right time because early on what we were doing was, you know, a ton of testing, a ton of proof of concepts, um, and then just trying to like move as fast as possible. And then at a certain point you have to say, okay, where are we now? What is like the shortest path to, to getting this thing released? Um, and it's great at that point to have like a fresh set of eyes come in and, and kind of help, you know, guide the process from there. Yeah, and I can imagine, especially given it, it sounds like it's a higher pressure project, um, and that is not a pressure that you want to impose on people for a long period of time. True. Yeah, you, you can't really keep up that exact you know pace and and have these you know uh, sort of poorly estimated tickets. At a certain point, you get into a rhythm, and you want to create you know a, a team velocity that you're all moving at. Um, so you you do have to kind of like for us, it was post um, private beta released to customers mm -hmm. that we said, okay, let's take a look at our operations. Let's like harden some of our processes now and, and make sure that we're building sustainably. So is that, beta. sorry, it, it, that, that looking at your operations, was that happening inside the virtual squad or is that more across the whole engineering org? Um, 
you know, I definitely think it's a mix of both, but it does, it did feel like it was being driven somewhat internally. Like you know, we had really great leaders who were looking at what we were doing too. And uh, we're really great at pointing out like, Hey, I think this, this is the moment to bring in that TPM, or you might want to think about, you know, uh, what this means for support or legal or like any of these other considerations that swirl around that are, you know, really important to actually uh, getting it to the last mile of like into a user's hands. Um, so a lot of it, a lot of the internal stuff was really around, you know, how do we, how do we build this with as little tech debt as possible? Let's make sure we don't go through any one-way doors with the architecture, um, mm -hmm. and and then to identify those areas where, where like you know we straight up copy pasted code from another team. Well, we went back and created right. another virtual squad with an engineer from our virtual squad and an engineer from the other squad where we took their code and and created this like unified uh, canvas component that we both could use. Right, so. You know, you you have to incur those slowdowns and pay down that debt, uh, but it was important to us to get user learnings faster. Yeah, and I can definitely see that that you know, getting the validation, the validation of the ideas, getting shaping it into something um, to actually decide whether this is worth the effort. Um, Absolutely. Given that it sounds like, I mean, it sounds quite costly. To, to run a virtual squad in this way, in terms of uh, that it requires more effort and you are taking resources from other departments or other teams. So it's not, you know, it's something that, have you, have, has there been an attempt to actually try and budget, like cost it out specifically? Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I think, you know, we, we always look at what the potential opportunity is for us. And in this case, you know, if we improve um, the developer experience on our platform, we can sell more developer seats. So we look at, you know, the the opportunity from like what customer demand is. And, uh, you know, we can do calculations on, around those team sizes and what it means to, uh, to get this lift and then look at what we're investing in it um, up front. Right. And, and, and in this particular case, we're not quite sure yet if Specs gets folded back into, we have a developer persona team called Inspect. Um, mm -hmm. This work just might fall back into that squad or it might stay as its own separate track long-term. You know, especially if it's proving customer value and it's starting to generate uh, its own revenue. Um, that's that's an opportunity for us to like reevaluate what this looks like and maybe we staff it up for the long haul. Right, and this is actually this leads into another question that we have from the chat here from Mustak again, asking, um, yeah, how do you plan for plan ahead for stuff in that project in the long term? Is it uh, is it a situation where the virtual squad becomes a real squad, um, or is it uh, does it hand, get handed off to an existing squad, or what do you normally do? Yeah, um, I mean, I guess I guess there isn't necessarily a normal um, like. It, it sort of depends, um, like with the, the shared canvas component we made between another squad and, and the, you know, the component that we had uh, copy pasted, that's going to have shared ownership forever um, and, and will require some time from, you know, both uh, teams that are contributing to it. Um, the case for specs, I think, that's why it was so important to get it done in three months or less, um, because we wanted to start to get that customer signal. Because all told, if this isn't the solution, it's better to find out early and you know scrap this and figure out what we need to do instead. So I think it's it's important to look ahead, but you don't want to look too far ahead. Um, if you have a specific outcome or goal in mind, like that's your north star, and and see what you need to do there. Like, do you need to invest more? Like, you think you're close to something and you need to invest a few more months out, or it's a smashing success. Let's staff this up now and, and keep it going long term. Right. Uh, it's so. How does it? What do your existing squads look like? As in, not the non-virtual squads. What are the teams that you're pulling from? Sure. Um, so, as an engineering manager, manager at Envision, I'm, I'm currently running uh, four different squads. So, I pulled some folks from my other squads. Uh, this product is for the developer persona. So, like the core team we took from was Inspect, because uh, this is going to support that persona the greatest. Um, outside of that, we looked at opportunities for like we were about to do some some pivot with uh, some other teams 
projects. And so, and they had some really dynamite backend people. So it was good to bring them in to, to help us build something out in Greenfield. Um, we had to reach pretty far to get some people with like the historical knowledge we needed, people that had been in the company for five or six years. Um, and in each of those cases, like you want to, you want to balance a lot of different things because you need to think about that individual that you're pulling in and the story they want to tell at Envision, right? Because they're oftentimes going to be, you know, they're vying for promotion or figuring out what's next in their career. So right. you want to make sure that like you're helping them tell the right story. You want to, you want to make sure that like the teams that are sacrificing that velocity are getting recognized as part of your success. It isn't just this team. It is the company wide effort. Like we're all yeah. in. Um, so I think those are some of the ways that, that you know, it, it helps you recruit the right people. Um, but it, it can really be a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting because that, I think, gives me some of the best insight into why this works. I think certainly I was initially skeptical, uh, as I always am, of, you know, new approaches. Um, but if it's a situation where you have teams representing different uh different business value or different you know parts of the business and you have a new feature or project that is going to benefit multiple parts of the business in one um and that if they are going to need to do their own engineering on it it makes total sense to pull from those teams especially because what you're doing is you're also creating the knowledge within those teams, seeding the knowledge as the project is created. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and then, you know, there are all kinds of personal reasons. Maybe you have a node developer who's wanting to jump into Go or like just get some exposure to that, you know, that world. Uh, so I, I think you have to find like both, you know, the business case and like the personal case for why it makes sense. And, um, uh, it's not always the easiest, but like fortunately, we have a, a really great talent pool at Envision, and that certainly helps. <laughs> That's fantastic. How, how many engineers, or not just engineers, but team members who would be in these squads? How roughly how many people do you have for that? Um, I believe somebody can correct this on Twitch uh, if anyone's there, but I believe we're just over two hundred engineers in the org. Fantastic. And it's not just, I mean, presumably it's not just engineers that you pull into these squads. It's its uh, designers, um, design. writers. Yep, exactly. Um, marketing folks, uh, customer facing people. Yeah, it, it really is like, you know, when you do something like this, it's the, the products you build is somewhat insular in a, in a silo. But like if you're not thinking about it holistically and how it connects and like lines up to the business, like, well, I don't know who approved it um, for one, and then you know for another, like it isn't, it's not going to get out of the gate. So you have to put in the legwork just across all all the different verticals of the business. Do you, when you're doing that, how does um, UX research fit into that? Is it is it do you have does the whole team do UX research together at the beginning, or is it uh, is does UX research already has it already been done? Yeah, oftentimes. Oftentimes it's already been done. Like we try to have product and design uh, a bit ahead of engineering for for obvious reasons. So, you know, hopefully they have some high fidelity prototypes. They're getting in front of our customers. Um, we're also getting signal just from our customer research, like that's generally ongoing, right? So that's how we mm -hmm. dip into the, the broader business insights, and that really comes down to our product manager uh, being connected into you know those worlds and looking for like the big dollar opportunities for us. Um, and then, and then working with design on on creating the experience that we're then going to test. Um, but we also like to have developers having a seat at the table there too. I mean, a lot of why we're able to dog through these things is we're the customers for these tools. So, like the Inspect team, most of them are front end developers that had formerly used Inspect at their other jobs. So, right. um, <laughs> you know that that's always really helpful um, to make sure that you know, like we want to solve the problems of our customers, but it's really helpful to to be solving our own problems along the way. Yeah, and we find that obviously a lot at Launch Darkly as well. <laughs> um, you know, we are <laughs> often using the product just as much, if not more, than anybody else. Um, and uh, and so meeting our own needs is is how a lot of our work tends to happen. The uh, it's interesting actually. We we have something at Launch Darkly that is doesn't. We, we, I mean, we recently engineering has recently switched how it self organizes in squads, um, and especially. Uh, well, it, it's not, we haven't, it, instead of being called engineering, it, it's, it is product delivery. 
mm. which includes which includes designers um, and UX people, and uh, it's and so they are these cross-functional teams that that work on specific parts of the product. Um, but once a quarter, we have this you know week that actually ultimately is just a couple of days where uh, people who've been itching to add something new or experiment with something new in the product just pull together a team. They just come up with an idea, they throw it out there, and people volunteer to join their team just for a couple of days and see what we get done. It's known as moonshots. I love that. Uh, and it's great for experimenting because it, it, it's a, you know, this burst of energy where we come up with incomplete demos. You know, it's, it's very rare that something ready that is good enough to be shipped is produced during those two days. Um, but there's been a whole load of product improvements that have gone live as a result of being born in a moonshot. That's incredible. It's, yeah. Um, yeah, happy to, to share more information about it. I mean, actually, this year we're thinking might might want to video some of it because normally it happens, obviously, in the office. Most of it um, this year is probably going to be a bit different. Also, I really love how you reframed um, engineering as product delivery. Just having that sort of like more holistic or like inclusive language can like break down barriers and make it so much easier oh, yeah. to collaborate. And, you know, we like our, our engineers have really strong opinions about UX and, you know, our designers are all really thoughtful about how something is built and engineered and, and know where we need to make those trade-offs. It's, it's always about having like a ton of overlap there. So I, I like that. Um, that, that you're that you're uh, referring to the teams in that kind of way. Yeah, it's definitely something we we don't um, even though and it, it's tempting to give software the engineers priority, given that we are um, pro at the majority of our customers who actually use the product day to day are engineers, um, right. but certainly not all. And uh, um, and there's a whole load of good reasons to make sure that that you don't that you, that you give more level um, equity to different members or different disciplines within the project product creation process. Um, yeah, doing the the cross functional thing um, is hugely valuable, especially if you can involve them in the UX part. So having some uh, buy in not to um, the solution, but to the solving the problem, right? So they don't, you don't necessarily get attached to a solution, you get attached to solving the problem, however you end up doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sorry, uh, stop rambling about how we do things. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's touched on, uh, thank you, I'm, I'm glad it's useful. Uh, it's, uh, and I think it's, it's in, you know, it, it, it'd be very valuable for us to, in the longer term, compare how our different companies do these things and the lessons that we've learned. Um, it, and it touches, uh, I think that thing around, around arranging into squads touches on something that I have seen more and more, um, some wisdom that I've seen, which is that when you get a team, a small team that works really well together, do not break that team up. Um, Absolutely. Those dynamics are incredibly valuable. Yes. Um, and it, it's not necessarily like easy to replicate, you know, because again, like it, it's about that team building trust. It's about them building a communication shorthand. It's about, you know, it's, um, it's, that's definitely something to be protected. It's working. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I mean, this leads into the question, which is, you know, if you have squads or small teams that are working really well, um, it must be quite taxing, or do, is it? Do you take that into account when you are building virtual squads? So, which teams are currently working really well, and which teams are not working? And, you know, try and uh, maybe you know avoid splitting up teams that are working well. Maybe do try and use virtual squads as a way to find new groups that work well together. Sorry. But. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's where the temporary nature of the virtual squad comes back. And I think as a rule, you, if you have too many virtual squads, maybe your organization is just set up incorrectly for the kind of business you're trying to run, right? Because uh, you, you don't want to ship your org, right? right. Uh, but you do want to 
you know, try and optimize those lines so that people, you know, can move as fast as, as, as they want within those guardrails. But um, if you have a high functioning squad, like the inspect squad was, you know, uh, some people were pulled out of that to work on specs. Uh, you know, you, you, you take that hit uh, to the velocity, but you're also like hopefully able to take the practices that they've learned there and evangelize those on the other squads they move to. And, um, and, and then they're going to get exposure to other teams and see how they're running their processes. Oh, at the beginning of the retro, you know, they're going to start with, um, you know, outlier tickets that like, why was this one so much shorter than we thought? Or this one was so much longer. And like, oh, that's a great practice I can bring back to my squad. And as long as it's a temporary arrangement, you know, you're giving them an opportunity to see another way of working, which will either like fortify what they love about your squad, or it's an opportunity to bring in change. Because you can also get stale, right? If you just work the right. same way, day in, day out. And that's that's interesting. I mean, that that the as we were talking before, the being able to cross pollinate practices that are working effectively is fantastic. But how do you? How do those teams, and when they start working together, and you've got a bunch of people who are all used to working in slightly different ways, how do you pick the working methods for that team? Uh, a lot of the times the work will help you do that. Um, cert, certain projects are better suited for Kanban, certain ones are better suited for mm -hmm. sprints. Um, and then don't be afraid to change your process if it isn't working, right? Maybe agree, disagree and commit early to a way of working, and, and then check in. That's what retros are for, right? Is to right. say, hey, is this actually serving us the best that it could? Or is there something new we can try? It's interesting that you, you use both Kanban and Sprint and possibly other methods throughout the organization. Um, I suppose, you know, it depends on the kind of work that's being done. Sure. Uh, and, it's, um, and, and it sounds like, yeah, these virtual squads are a great, a great way to... To evolve this as well, um, I mean, do you know of? Uh, I'm interested now. Like for, um, what what are the things that you've seen come out of squads? What, as, as well as the core product that they were aiming for, what are some of the interesting side effects or some of the interesting problems um, that you've seen come out of these? Out of virtual squads or squads in general? Uh, virtual squads. Ah. Um. Well, I think I think um, that yeah, it's it's really the cross pollination thing. I think that that is the great thing, bringing those processes and and, and things back to your your regular squads. Um, also, you know, it I I think every time it's pretty unique, right? Because like again, like hopefully the virtual squads are an outlier, <laughs> so you don't get to do them too often. There, it, like you know, um, it really needs to be an opportunity that is important to the business. And something right. that you're not like structurally set up to accomplish. Sometimes you can just add an additional seat to an existing squad, and you're good to go. So um, again, I would say like I, you know I haven't had a ton of exposure to these. I've done maybe three or four in a career of ten years. Um, so oh, wow. okay, <laughs> you know. so they really are quite rare, or just they they're not the they're not the standard mo. Or I mean, or or they you know they can. Or, or they go. They exist for two weeks to accomplish mm -hmm. something across two different teams, and and they go by so fast that you barely notice it. It's a blip to your velocity on your team. Uh, you're sorting out a problem, like you're reducing your code footprint or whatever it is that you've set out to do with this very tiny virtual squad, and um, and you know it can almost go undetected, right? And uh, right, your goals for the quarter. So. Within the organization, within the overall organization, is that this is a standardized method of working in that it's it, it the virtual squad is a known entity and you have a standardized way of deciding, OK, we think this is worth doing. This is how we're proposing it. This is how we get approval, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of great standardized processes in place already. Uh, we use this format called DACES for uh, oh, yeah. um, choosing hard, difficult decisions, right? And mm -hmm. Um, and, and then, you know, product has a great way of generating briefs and we, we already have these practices that we do just within our squads that you can leverage to do this kind of work. It's just the additional factor is like, and we can't accomplish this with how we're set up today. Um, right. Right. And then, and then you, like, usually the only additional meetings are those to like, uh, to vet the value of it and, and to get those approvals up the chain. 
but but every other part of it you know once you're in the virtual squad it runs like a squad um it's it's gold like a squad you know you're uh, yeah every, everything about it should look the same except that you know after that quarter hopefully uh it dissolves and uh, everyone goes back to what they were previously working on yeah, and uh, sorry uh, for those who don't know. I, I just posted the link in in the uh, Twitch chat for Daisy D A C I, um, which I I had not heard of before I came to launch Darkly, but um, it's a uh, because there are many ex Atlassian people at launch Darkly, and it is a I posted a link to the Atlassian team playbook, which is where it comes from. D Daisy stands for Driver, Approver, Contributors, and Informed. Um, I'm generally used to a Daisy being, you know, a template for a for a one page document that that um, kind of explains the aim and the the proposal. Um, but it's uh, very useful for those of you who um, looking for a structure, especially it it's um, it's useful to have structures for proposing ideas and a common language for it. Um, it's uh, especially as you grow as an organization. It's it's, it's uh, really helpful at, at putting the persona, or like the people that are uh, you know driving it and approving it, uh, top of of mind too, so they don't get lost in the shuffle. So you know, like like who you need to influence. Or uh, I, I really like how it um, at, at the top of at least our, the template we use for it, which yeah. we have a lot of ex Atlassian folks too. Um, it really is about um, putting the people like on top of of yeah. know, everything, right? We have that as well, and yeah. it's um, you know it, it, because it's a vitally important question when doing the approval. Um, <laughs> it's like it, and and it's interesting because a lot of it comes down to trust. There's quite often you see the people who are involved, and you can go look. I trust them. I know they wouldn't be wasting their time on something they didn't think it was important. Yeah, absolutely. So do you have uh, how much approval does a virtual squad need? And what, what does that look like? Yeah, um, I, I think it's all based on what the goal or outcome is. If it's a two-week project, uh, I think the engineering manager on, on the two squads involved or three squads involved can sort that out. Um, you know, there's a lot of this stuff you can kind of um, uh, launder <laughs> through like your normal working mm -hmm. cycles. Um, and you're, it's easier... I think, you know, like if if the amount of effort being put in and, and like the risk is relatively low, I think like owning those decisions like lower in the org is where those should be. Um, when it's something like creating a new document type and, you know, figuring out how you're going to market that and roll it out, of course, you know, that's on the other end of the spectrum where uh, you really need to get approvals like all the way up through the org because you're you're. You're going to be making, you know, a fundamental change to the business and potentially, you know, committing people to uh, a years long um, investment. Right. So how do you um, how do you when presumably the approvers are going to want to see the risks that you've evaluated? Um, what what do you what do you normally look to look to to those risks? What kind of questions are you answering? Um, uh, I think the biggest risk is, is how long do we does it take to get to signal? Um, because that is time that is otherwise spent doing something else that is hopefully moving the needle forward in the business. Like time right. is the, the chief factor. Um, so you want to say like, you know, uh, you, you want to, you really want to frame it in like, Hey, we can get to learnings, um, and, in three months. And if, if it's a bust, then we're on to the next thing. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, let's see. The I'm just. By the way, uh, just to, for the audience, we are um, talking about virtual squads with Ben Wilson from Envision. Uh, we're going to be going for another ten minutes or so, I think. So please, if you have any questions, if you have any questions about this, then um, please post them in the yes. in the stream and chat. We should. Sorry, excuse me. Um, uh, the um, what are the other? I'm sorry, I'm trying to think. So, so actually, one thing I was asking about earlier was um, when it goes wrong, because I'm always interested in in failure stories. Um, do you have any 
any particular lessons or situations where it did, just didn't work out and why it didn't work out? Yeah. Um, a few years ago, I, I tried to do something similar at, um, at another startup. And the, um, I think, you know, the, the opportunity was right. The business was excited about it. So we, we had done our diligence to get buy-in um, and, and everybody on board. But there were a lot of people really excited about the project that wanted to be attached to it. And we kind of felt like, well, the more the merrier. Like, you know, I'm not going to turn down, um, you know, just adding in uh, brilliant people that want to help us uh, solve this problem. But, you know, of course, as you add folks, uh, you add complexity to the communication. You, you, you know, add, t like, challenges around scheduling. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, it, it just, uh, that's why, like, I, I'm now more on the side of like, if anything, you might want to run the, the squad a little ever so slightly understaffed just to make right. sure that everyone's really extending themselves because they understand that this is a finite amount of time where they're going to just run, you know, as, as hard and, and as fast as they can. Um, so I would say, yeah, you know, uh, bringing in a, a technical project, project manager uh, too early, I've, I've had issues around that. So we're, you know, we're suddenly, we have all these unknowns that we would like to just answer uh, but we're we're already being tasked with trying to estimate, you know, uh, complexity and uncertainty, which you can do on a per ticket basis, but it's much harder to do with like overarching architecture. And and so again, like you know, just having um, having a handful of people that want to run fast and treat this opportunity sort of like a startup, like a mini startup within the org, um, is is a is a way to avoid that because I've, I've definitely had that issue of too many people wanting to hop on to a, an exciting opportunity and it just kind of toppled over. Uh, we weren't able to to get it in the window we needed uh, to to prove value. So mm. yeah, and I yeah I can see how it, you've got to be so careful otherwise the the, the virtual squad takes on a, a life on its own <laughs> of its own that consumes more than it provides. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so. We need to. Uh, oh, actually, sorry. One more question um, from the audience. Uh, yeah. Have you considered using contractors for something like this? Oh, um, yeah. I think that can that can absolutely work, um, especially if it's greenfield or net new. Like, it depends on on how much you're going to be building on your existing systems or how much like institutional knowledge is required to get started. Because ramping up mm -hmm. folks can, can really be a challenge. Um, but you know, you, you need contractors that aren't um, going to be sticklers about having a brief for everything and yeah. <laughs> and wanting that well-groomed backlog. Like, these are contractors that need to act as owners. So, like, that's a, that's a particular type of individual you're going to look to contract in those cases. Yeah. And that's, um, it's fascinating. I would love to see more work into uh, how we get that that pool of contractors and ability to to extend temporarily. Um, there are so many situations uh, that I've been in where I think about, look, this is a really nicely, tightly defined unit of work. And if we had a procurement system internally where I could just say, look, let's throw a certain amount of money at this and get it done. Um, there, there are so many ways it could unblock things and provide um, because often in in certain organizations the problem isn't money it's people and time yeah um, yeah but yeah it, something it's, to um yeah i was gonna say it's also really great if you know you've worked with those people before and, and you have that trust mm -hmm. and um and if they're open to you know contract to hire that's always great too You're like hey if this thing takes yeah. off would you you know would you consider coming on board and 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 helping us you know run with this because again, like yeah. if the contractor leaves, it's much harder to uh, to ramp somebody else up on the project, you know. Um, whereas, like yeah. if somebody rolls off, but they still have the context of what they worked on, you can still pair them up with somebody new coming on board. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, having that knowledge walk out the door suddenly um, <laughs> can be deadly for a project. Yeah, absolutely. So we need to wrap things up in a moment, sure. but uh, before we go, I I really wanted to find out more about your craft, especially the little box and, and how you made it. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, so this was a, uh, I got married just about a year ago and mm -hmm. uh, for our first anniversary we're just making crafts for each other at home. Um, 
because with COVID, uh, not not a lot yes. you can really do and go out on the town right now. Uh, so I made this box with our, our Cricut Maker. Um, it's uh, it's pretty incredible. Like it's a plotter, so it, it cuts it, it scores it. Uh, you can actually drop pins into it and draw on it. And in this particular case, the, the concept behind this was, uh, this appears on my desk from time to time. Uh, it actually mm-hmm. showed up this morning. So, and then inside it, there's always a, a prompt. Um, in this case, it's something from your Cortado trip uh, because, you know, right. I still will don the mask and, and run out to the coffee shop. Um, so I'm going to have to take my Instax camera, um, which mm-hmm. just takes these mini Polaroids, and uh, I'll take a picture from my walk. I'll throw it in the box, hide it somewhere, uh, you know, in the house, and then uh, <laughs> my wife can uh, discover that. So, uh, That's so charming. De- definitely recommend those. They're, they're, they're incredible devices. Oh, yeah. I was actually, I'd never heard of it until literally an hour ago, when, <laughs> just before we started the stream. And now I'm going to put a, a link to it in the chat if anybody wants to find out. Uh, neither of us are financially affiliated <laughs> with Cricket. <laughs> it's important. Um, to point, yeah. Um, no, I just love the but, construction of boxes. I think, um, yeah. I think like a J.J. Abrams tech talk from like a decade or more ago. Yes, I remember that he one. He constructed a, a Kleenex box and I was like, I don't, I don't look at boxes enough. So I started deconstructing them and then it just got fun to try to figure out how to, uh, to make and assemble my own. <laughs> yeah. And you were saying you've got like on your laptop as well, you've, you've, you've cut out a whole oh, bunch yeah. of uh, <laughs> stickers and things. The, uh, sure. Well, can see look. Oh, oh, look at that. There, <laughs> right, and that's all stuff you made yourself. Yeah, yeah, I love, uh, I love just getting into Illustrator or Photoshop and uh, working with those tools. So um, I, I would love to be a designer. I don't quite have the chops for it, so I love working in a company that prizes design, such as Envision. You and me both. <laughs> I desperately, you know, I, I somehow when I was a kid, I had a huge amount of fun playing with deluxe paint on the Amiga, and. Ah. Uh, um and have and then photoshop came along and i didn't understand it and somehow i let it all go <laughs> yeah that's too bad yeah but it, it's really worth playing with these things again and yeah boxes i i'm gonna hit you up later for, for the um uh yeah for, for some more tips about boxes because that does sound fascinating well if you get one of those i'll send you all my templates yeah i've got a i've got a whole stockpile of them now <laughs> brilliant Excellent. thank you so much Oh, um, and Heidi, I think the chat was talking about the Pharaoh drawing. The uh, oh, what? <laughs> Sorry, Heidi, not sure what you're talking about. The Pharaoh drawing, um, or was it something Ben, or something on the cricket? Um, on the uh, oh, deluxe paint. Oh, the Tutankhamun, right? Tutankhamun image, which is the standard um, on the box for deluxe paint, and ah, paint. yes. You know, <laughs> and, wow, and the great thing about that paint. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. You can probably um <laughs> yeah, the picture that they lied to us about being able to make. <laughs> you know, if unless you want to painstakingly hand color sure. all the pixels. <laughs> um, Stipple it with pixels and yeah. Ooh. Sure, why not? Spent a couple of years on that. <laughs> of course, it's like the SVG Tiger that somehow yeah, someone yeah. put together. Um <laughs> anyway. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Ben. Thank you for the the talk about um, virtual squads. And I have to say, you know, as I said, I was somewhat skeptical coming in, but there's a whole load about this that makes a huge amount of sense, um, especially for creating things that are co-owned by multiple parts of the organization and spreading that knowledge, making sure that he has it. Awesome. Um, yeah. Let me know if you end up using it. I'd be here. Will do. To hear your, uh... Yeah, your thoughts. Yeah. And um, yeah, again, it'd be lovely to compare notes more on how we do things at Launch Darkly and how you how you work at Envision. Uh, it'd be fabulous. Um, so we will have, thank you everybody for joining us on the stream. This video will um, go up within the next month or so. Um, we on the blog with a transcript. And um, we, I'm not sure. We don't have a decide yet when the next test in production will be. If you are interested in talking to us about something, if you have something you want to tell the world about, um, how you test in production, how you keep things moving, how you test out new ideas, and then please get in touch with us at Launch Darkly. Um, and we would love to have you on the show. Um, until then, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ben. Thank great. you. Yeah. And um, yes, see you all soon.
Have a great day.